um, they were they were there for like 20 plus years and um, and I just kind of freaked out. I thought these creative and engineering geniuses, they're spending so much time industrial line magic, pouring their heart and souls into these blockbuster works. And at the end of the day, it's pretty thankless. I don't know if you've ever seen the credits of um, these blockbuster movies, like especially Marvel movies. Uh, special effects are amazing, but you're just like, you know, you're, you're in a block of like a VFX house that just scrolls right by. And these are like certified genius people. And I thought, and who had artistic aspirations or engineering aspirations. And, you know, this was in the Presidio in the Bay Area. Uh, in San Francisco. And so they were stones throw away from all these amazing startups that were happening at the time. And I couldn't help but um, freak out that um, if I was gonna become an artist, I kind of had to get out of the track of this, um, I don't know, this kind of uh, hamster wheel of a genius factory in, in a way. And so I uh, applied to Columbia in New York and I moved to New York to, to attend grad school here. Um, and um, at the time, uh, how would I say? Um, I would say I was surrounded by a lot of peers who were really trying to rapidly professionalize themselves in the art world. And um, I had friends who were, for example, like painters who were like super prolific. They knew exactly who they were and what they wanted to do. Um, I had one friend, he had a whole mission that he was gonna create the world's ugliest paintings. And you know that might be like a ridiculous premise, but it's like a super challenge and it's specific. And he was on a mission to do that for two years. And he filled up the, the hallway with his paintings because he was so prolific. And eventually I had to store some of his paintings in my studio. And by comparison, I felt um, very, very inept and very, very lost. And um, I had no idea who I was or what I was meant to do. And it was only all the more pressure to see these people around me who knew exactly what they wanted to do. And in a way, like you could, you know, hold your nose up to like, oh, making the world's ugliest painting. Like what kind of goal is that? But I, I, I thought it was like, oh man, that guy has a North Star. Like oh, I envied it so much that this person had a North Star and was just without any doubt, just going for it. And um, to see that for two years was extremely demoralizing and very scary for me. Um, and it was only after that I graduated from Columbia, um, I applied to work for, well, I had a fork in the road, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, I you know, had $400 in my bank account. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna apply to this UX position at Google New York. I have no experience in UX. I just thought this would be like, you know, God forbid, like, you know, if I could just get an entry, if I could just get an interview, like maybe something could happen. And then simultaneously I also applied to work for these two artists who I really admired and loved um, and managed to get in contact with them. Uh, an artist called Pierre Wieg, a French artist, and uh, an artist called Paul Chan, who's starting, starting a publishing company. And I, I thank God, I thank the universe that, you know, Google never like called me because I would have totally taken that job. Uh, at the time, out of desperation, and I'm I'm really 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 I thank the universe that I uh, they never you know I'm, I was underqualified and, but I'm so grateful that they never called back um, ever gave me a chance because it led me down this whole other path um, with working with Pierre and Paul and I got to really see firsthand uh, what it was like in the details of the day what it was like to be an artist and so uh, I could you know hear about what they ate in the morning I could they you know they weren't like lecturing me, but they, I would ask them like, oh, like, what'd you do this morning? And they would say, well, they exercise in this particular way. Um, or um, they said, Ian, don't come in until 1130. And I was like, why? Like, you know, I'm here to help. Um, and they said, um, effectively, the answer was like, they wanted to protect their morning. And I learned so much from this because the morning is when you're still dreaming, you know, like you're waking up from your dream or from sleeping and you're still in this fluid, pliable state. Your brain is open to the most um, to the least amount of judgment, the most amount of um, maybe serendipity. And they exercise, both of them independently, they exercise this thing where they just wouldn't have people around in the morning so that they could, and they wouldn't do email in the morning either. And so they could just focus on the creative problems at hand that they were, that they were wrestling with. And so I learned about like, I don't know, the nuts and bolts of what it might feel like to be an artist on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, this was better school than school. Um, it was uh, kind of a, crash course on how to be an artist. Um, and um, there's no really clear way of teaching that besides just seeing it up front uh, in a way uh, and being in proximity to it. Um, and then I also learned a lot about how to just communicate with um, this funny place called the art world, how to say no to people, how to say yes, how to say, how to fight for, and in a way I was like litigating for these artists uh, as their you know, project manager, as their system. I was like kind of negotiating things for them, um, pushing back on things that they asked for. And it was no, you know, no embarrassment for me. It was so fun to like 
push for someone else and advocate for someone else. Uh, and I learned a lot just by doing that, by inhabiting that role and kind of LARPing a, a person with some authority on behalf of the artist. Um, I learned so much about just how to communicate with this funny world that is the art world. Um, that is very hierarchical and very gate kept and very nepotistic, um, but also in some ways uh, very open and um, um, curious too. So um, fast forward around um, 2012, I started working on my own work finally. And I wanna show you this one very, very early work. Um, it might seem very primitive, but I just wanna, I think it's worth seeing just to see where things started. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Um, I'm just gonna share this. Does this work? Can you see my screen here? Yep. Okay. <coughs> um, so this work, uh, I'll play a little bit of it first and then I'll talk about it maybe. Or else I'll skip ahead. <laughs> So this work's called This Papaya Tastes Perfect, and um, it came into being out of total desperation. So someone who I'm like graduated with at Columbia, he was a painter called Clay. He decided, forget art. I don't want to do art, but I want to be a gallerist. And so he opened up a little gallery in Miami. And uh, at a certain point, he offered me a show there because um, he, I don't know, we enjoyed each other's company. I didn't make anything. So he had no idea what I was going to make, but on faith that uh, I would do something of interest to him. Uh, like he, he let me do a show there and I swear like leading up to the show uh, maybe four months out uh, before the show like was to open I had no idea what I was doing um, I had so many ideas on the drawing board anything from like installation to like doing the music to doing the performance to doing sculptures which I know nothing about sculpture uh, to doing like kind of these text paintings um, I was like all over the map. I was so, in a way, excited for the opportunity, but also so um, anxious about um, finding um, something, I don't know, um, kind of doing a work that would actually uh, contain all my interests and say something about like where I was going and what I was going to make. And you can imagine, you know, one's first show, so much pressure, like what is it that you're presenting? And I had no idea, like I didn't have a history of making things in a coherent and finished way before. And out of sheer desperation, I went to the roof of my Chinatown, tiny Chinatown apartment uh, one night. And I just like, I just sat there like um, asking myself like, what am I doing here? What am I doing? Like, what does this really have to be? This is after having gone through like hundreds of ideas and pitching some of them to him and getting very lukewarm responses. And at a certain point, I don't know, it's it like some out of desperation. I, I feel like a voice said to me like, you know, do the thing that really freaks you out. Like that's what that's what came to me. So like, do what scares you. Um, and what came to mind immediately was this um, very brutal fight that I'd seen in Wall Street a few years back. <laughs> and it was um, this really strange situation where a cab driver had stopped in front of and almost hit this um, huge Australian couple that was walking out of a bar. And they got into this really protracted chase, kind of Tom and Jerry chase around the cab. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen a fight before, um, but it's very, very brutal and visceral, but it's usually really fast. Like if a fight actually happens, it's over in like one or two punches. Um, this thing dragged out for like 45 minutes around chasing around the car. And so by the time people, the Australian couple and this cab driver were uh, like 30 minutes in, like everyone was like bone tired you know i don't know if you ever watch boxing but like it's a game of stamina more than anything else to last that long and these are just like normal people running around you know and trying to hurt each other and eventually uh the cab driver like managed to crawl into his car 
uh, when they were like kind of resting from chasing him and came out with a hammer and like they charged at him and he just blindly struck and he hit them both. And then the cops came. And so what struck me about this was it was so brutal, but so protracted. I've never seen violence so drawn out before and so desperate and tired. And it definitely freaked me out when I saw it and I definitely won't forget it. Um, but uh, I also like deeply wanted to understand like what about it scared me. And so I had that in my mind, like when I was on my Chinatown roof, uh, this is in 2012. And simultaneously, I was thinking a lot about what really struck me about my experiences at Industrial Light Magic. And one of them was this um, attempt to do motion capture for Pirates of the Caribbean. And when they were doing motion capture, it was always really smoothed out at the end. So the characters would always feel like they're flying from pirate ship to pirate ship. They would feel like almost like frictionless or um, totally um, smooth and perfect in their, their movements. They were all cleaned up. And I thought, oh, maybe there's a way to capture a performance map it to a 3D avatar, but do it in a way that captured an, an alive and kind of raw demonic energy that I found and experienced and remember from this, this kind of weird bar fight. And that sounds like such a stupid premise to make an artwork like, oh, it's like a memory and some technology I want to use and just kind of mash them together. It sounds stupid in retrospect when I describe it that way. But I have to say at the time, the energy of the raw power of this memory and like trying to recapture that with a performer and that the performer like I got the performer a little drunk too. And I worked with a choreographer, um, my friend Madeline Hollander, and she like totally understood the energy and to like capture that energy. Something about this artwork that I'm, I'm kind of like wanna dwell on this a little bit. Um, something about this artwork stays with me because of that, that I felt like I captured that energy accurately, um, that kind of primal energy. And it's one thing for an artwork to have a kind of iconoclasm or a rawness or, um, uh, a desire to shock. I mean, definitely this artwork wasn't meant to shock anyone, um, but I definitely felt that all these other concerns, whether they're technological to do motion capture, um, philosophical concerns, all these other things, ideas about skill and how you put something together, all these other artistic concerns, um, I think are in a way sometimes moot or like ineffective without this primal energy driving the artwork. And I, I bring this up now because it's something I forget all the time and I've only recently in a way rediscovered. Um, but it's something that um, I'm trying to remember now in a way like talking to you about it like makes me want to remember it more that um, it's this integration of primal energy that's so important. It's not the primal energy itself because I think you can, of course you can see a wild performance and you know, we all chalk it up to like, oh, a crazy artist, like, oh, they're be out enacting like some inner child, like fair enough, whatever. But when you can integrate it into all the constellation of other things that you're concerned about as an artist, um, for me, that's like the most exciting thing to see like as a viewer of art. Um, that's why I love to see this integration of all these concerns, whatever they are, skill and a primal energy, a kind of um, uh, a, a risk in a way. Um, someone so told me recently that the diff a friend of mine um, said the difference between art and craft is risk. And I, I kind of understand what that means in the sense of this. You're risking something that scares you. You're risking exposing something, some darkness or primal energy, and you're actually expressing that primal energy in an unconscious primal way through the artwork. Um, uh, and you're not like pontificating about it and you're not like intellectualizing it or trying to rationalize it away. Um, it's somehow channeled through the artwork and it's bridged into the viewer's mind. Like I hope, I mean, I know we're on Zoom, but um, I hope you get a sense of like the energy you could feel if imagine a huge projection of this. Uh, it's like inaudible people yelling at you. Um, it's kind of a stupid work, but I'm very proud of it for the retention of this energy. Anyways, um, just to fast forward to around 2013, after making this work, um, I started to imagine, started to think like, oh, like I want to make more to do with animation. I want this sense of aliveness, but I don't necessarily want to animate everything. I don't want to motion capture everything. I don't want to have to hire a performer every time I want to do one little thing. And so I started imagining like maybe I could do um, something like a video game, but one that plays itself. And I started calling these things simulations um, that if I could be in a way, a um, like a, a kind of demigod over a virtual world, uh, kind of like the video game, The Sims, a game I totally love. Um, uh, if I could be kind of a demigod or kind of behavior designer and then let these kind of virtual creatures go, um, I think I could achieve a similar sense of aliveness and electricity um, without having to labor over every single detail that a traditional animation process or even a motion cap capture process would require. 
Um, and then it would allow me to free up some creative energy um, to think about behavior almost on a higher level or, or a more kind of um, managerial plane um, to kind of consider a whole ecosystem rather than just like one little movement of the arm or a realistic hand movement. And so the first work I did in this vein was called uh, Entropy Wrangler. I'm gonna show you a little bit of it here. Um, So like this started from a very basic place. I started, you know, I Googled what's like a, a video game engine that like is open, like is, is free, uh, has like a community of support and it turned out to be <clears throat> this video game engine called Unity. And, I, you know, I start artworks, I, I really believe can sometimes start from very unconscious, stupid places. Um, I just th I thought, oh, I'll put all the things I like or things I'm interested in. I'll just have three, make three models of them, stick them in one virtual space, and um, crucially, assign each one uh, a different physics behavior or a different physics uh, property, um, and just let them go. Kind of, a, kind of like a, I don't know, uh, Hunger Game style. Just kind of like let everyone just like uh, mess each other up. Uh, and for example, uh, the properties of uh, a few of these objects is a kind of stickiness. And so uh, you can imagine once it gets in contact with. Uh, one of the other objects, it sticks to that, and then it sticks to other things, and quite quickly you get a kind of assemblage or a kind of virtual sculpture, uh, but that's always in flux, that's always con constantly um, colliding with some other object and then re-sticking to another object or breaking another object. And over time, the energy of this closed system would dissipate to zero. Um, its entropy would be at its extreme. And, but then one little behavior, maybe like this little dolphin here, it would flip its little flipper and then that would kick off a cinder block and then that would cause and catalyze a chain reaction of new kind of entropic and chaotic behavior that would just re-energize the whole system. And as I was making this, it was, um, I found myself like watching, like making a little tweak of the behavior and then just watching it for hours and then making another little tweak and watching for hours and it kind of felt like procrastination, but I knew for myself, I felt like I had stumbled into something um, uh with a lot of potentiality that i could entertain myself watching this that there was some some joy was sparked in the making of it um and that was such a important like pinch you know pinch myself awake that this is like maybe there's something here to explore and so um i'm just gonna go briefly here the over the next maybe four or five years i made a bunch of simulations um uh, trying to get deeper and deeper into understanding the unique game engine, what it meant to make something that could potentially, you know, you could leave these things on and they would just go on forever. Um, I'm showing you a video here as a screen recording, but actually they're works of software. They're made in Unity video, they're made in the Unity video game engine and they um, they just run, they can run potentially forever and things keep changing. And um, around 2015 though, I start to feel that the series of simulations I made were in a way uh, playful experiments but fundamentally um, meaningless um, in the sense that I started to lose faith in the decisions I was making uh, about what goes into the simulation. It can no longer just be stuff I like. I'm, when I'm on my 10 simulations, like that kind of, I had too much self-doubt at the time. And I started to think that the thing that is the vehicle for meaning um, that we know so well is storytelling, is a story. And so I thought, oh, if I could combine a story with the open-ended chaos of this simulation, I would have effectively, <coughs> excuse me, two sculpting forces that were at odds with each other. And so um, I started uh, with this idea that there would be an open-ended simulation with lots of different characters in it. Uh, each had their own very basic AI, but that there would be one character called the emissary who had a, uh, a script that um, it wanted to pursue in this open-ended chaos. Um, the first one I did was this uh, simulation. It's called Emissary in the Squad of Gods. I'll just say very briefly, the story I gave myself was um, it's an ancient community living on the side of a volcano. They don't know the volcano is active and they're just going about their life. Um, and there's one character, I'm going to try to find her. Um, let's see. 
this character in red and she's she's the emissary and she has unlike all the other characters a script to um try to convince her community to leave the volcano because it's going to erupt she doesn't know it's going to erupt and it's never erupted before but she has this premonition that it is and it's she's programmed to try to convince them to leave um just to back up for a sec um the ai that governs all these other characters was also kind of a sub project in this uh, in the making of emissaries um i became very interested in this idea of a multi-agent simulation um and in particular i was really in love with the ai um model that the sims had developed in uh, in the video game um which was very different um, from all previous AI in other video games. Usually when you play a video game, the AI that governs like, I don't know, the bad guys, um, they try to contain all the possible behaviors within uh, one coherent like AI model um, and very basic AI, like old fashioned AI. What the Sims did that was so innovative was uh, Will Wright said, oh, I think AI is more powerful when it's distributed between the agent and the environment that intelligence isn't just in you, it's a relationship between you and the objects in your environment. And all the objects in your environment are in a way um, opportunities for action. Um, and by that he meant um, every agent had a set of needs. So maybe they had a need for hunger, they had a hunger need, a thirst need, uh, the need to play, the need to sleep, basic urgent, almost like limbic or um, Maslow hierarchy needs. Um, and those needs are becoming more and more urgent over time if they were unmet. And in the environment, um, let's say a, a maybe a cup of water uh, or a water bottle, the water bottle would advertise to the sim, the agent, drink me if you're thirsty, I will satisfy your thirst. And so all these objects in the environment were had kind of virtual advertisements were for satisfying different behaviors. And what's so beautiful about this model is that any individual object um, could contain multiple opportunities for action to satisfy different and sometimes conflicting motivations. So you can imagine a water bottle, you know, the classic intelligence test, like what do you do with a water bottle or what do you do with a brick? You know, you can build a house, uh, you can throw it at someone, uh, you can like scrub it on the floor to like draw like the color, like a, a reddish color. Um, there's so many opportunities for action that are latent in any given object. It's, it's nearly infinite and so, sky's the limit to you know, uh, what you can do with an object. It's, bound only by one's imagination and creativity. And I think more specifically, um, the range of one's motivations. Um, and so anyways, the Sims pioneered this kind of model of intelligence, uh, this kind of way of organizing a simulation um, to have behaviors embedded in the objects themselves. And just as a side note, what's so cool about the Sims is also that when you got an update of the Sims, you didn't get like mm, some deep architectural like update of its fundamental software. You got a, you know, a furniture pack. And what's so beautiful about that is like you got a new fridge, but in the fridge, of course, was embedded all these new behaviors and opportunities for, for action uh, for um, the same Sims. You know, the Sims didn't change. It's the, the objects in their environment presented new affordances uh, for them to act on in new ways. Uh, and I love this idea. Uh, it, and it, it allowed for this infinite expandability that was actually fun to program. And so we implemented a version of that in Emissaries. So all these different agents you see in the environment, they're operating under this kind of needs-based AI, uh, and all the objects in the environment are um, objects of uh, um, uh, opportunity for action uh, with uh, kind of needs-based advertisements on them. And I would, over time, keep adding into it. Um, in this case, uh, this emissary is it was shown many, many times, and every show I would add like more behavior on all the, the same objects uh, to produce more and more emergent behavior amongst the agents. So what would inevitably happen, for example, is uh, let's say it was a water bottle. Um, one agent would be going after the water bottle to satisfy thirst. Another agent would be going after the same water bottle to maybe um, use it to hit like uh, uh, like some perceived threat on the head. <clears throat> but the moment of conflict was their convergence on the same object that meant different things to them. Um, and this, as you can imagine, creates a Cambrian explosion of emergent possibility um, when you have like multiple objects with multiple agents, all with competing needs. And so that's the landscape that emissaries are set in. And then on top of that, there's this emissary character who's trying to corral this like wild pack of AI agent, like do these dogs. Um, I mean, they're not literally dogs, but they're figuratively dogs, uh, these reactive a agents. Um, uh, trying to corral them into going along with her script. And what ends up happening oftentimes is this emissary agent gets 
de totally derailed from the script, gets pulled into the activities of the other agents, and you know fails at uh, her directive to convincingly move off the volcano. Um, once in a blue moon, she manages to like with perfect timing and like get catching catching the other agents at the right time. She manages to su succeed in this this endeavor. And um, emissaries, each emissary is structured around sort of a like that movie Groundhog Day. You know, this movie with Bill Murray waking up on the same day and kind of playing out that day a little differently to kind of explore the edges of how the world he is in works. And um, and uh, in the case of emissaries, the agent the emissary tries to do something, tries to do the script, fails or succeeds, and then tries again. And um, these simulations kind of like repeat themselves like Groundhog Day and try to play out all the possible ways that this world, this very limited um, world and this very limited narrative premise could play out. Um, I want to say like I'm summarizing this as if like I knew what I was doing at the time, but I totally didn't. You know, at the time um, I was interested in multi-agent simulation and I had this intuition that I needed to like embed a story in it somehow. And all of this kind of came together through the course of making this. Um, this was made, uh, the Emissary Trilogy was made over the course of two and a half years. And uh, I just want to say one crucial thing, which is I decided early on it would be a trilogy. Um, and to me, that was a way, it was a, a kind of lie I told myself to save myself because I get so doubtful sometimes making these projects. Like there's so many dark moments where like you just think it's the worst work in the world. Like no one should ever see this. I shouldn't even be looking at this. Like everything is wrong and you just don't want to go on. Um, and I felt over time that maybe there was a kind of perfectionism that I was after that if I could relax that perfectionism and say, I'm going to make a trilogy and, you know, maybe I have some technical idea about procedural animation. And I just don't have time for that here, but abandoning it here doesn't mean it's abandoned forever. It's going to put that in the next emissary work. Or um, this is looks like this looks really crummy now, but let's move on. Like the next emissaries is going to be an evolution of this uh, crumminess. Um, and it allowed me to kind of imagine a roadmap for myself for like two years. Like I wasn't going to work in, um, this wasn't a fresh project that I was just like going to do and pop off and then like be stuck with the same existential problem of like, oh, what do I make now? I was going to have a kind of gradual roadmap, kind of chapters of this work that could unfold. And each exhibition wasn't some precious, you know, show that I had to like nail and like it had to be a perfect show. It was just a pit stop uh, to show a version of the software in a way. That's how I told, that's why I told myself. Of course, I put effort into making the show like function and, you know, I tried to do the best shows I could, but I tried to relieve myself of the pressure that any, any given show was like it, the end all be all for a perfect artwork. Instead, it was just a pit stop to show the latest version of this evolving, um, updatable work of software. Um, and that was another paradigm shift for me, was to think about making art with the metaphor of software in mind. You know, you think about like a painting or sculpture, you know, I think about Jeff Koons sculptures because he's innovated so much with materials, but they're made to perfection. They take years and once he's done, they're just done. But he, you know, he can't tolerate a scratch on his sculpture. He can't tolerate a single imperfection. And that's like um, maybe a very brittle, for me, a kind of brittle way of working or maybe a way that's incompatible with the 21st century. Um, for me, like things are changing in the world so fast. Things are changing in my personal life so fast. I wanted to find a way to make work that had a kind of um, ethic of change built into it. And so I start to use this metaphor of making work as artworks as software. And in software, the expectations of finality are much more relaxed. You know, I read this funny story of Gmail. I don't know if you all use Gmail, but a Gmail, they released Gmail before it even had like basic features like blind CC or like, um, you know, the chat on side or like archiving or starring. They released it as like a beta software and they already had 2 million active users before they even started doing like BCC or these other basic email features. And it was just like this ongoing work of engineering um, whom they already released to the public and people were actively using it. And it was just getting better. It was like a stew that they just kept cooking and serving. And this was for me a profound change uh, in relaxing how I worked and in um, lowering the expectation for, for perfection, but raising the stakes on like, oh, this is a live living thing constantly um, um, that I can always improve on and tinker with. And we can get to maybe like the pitfalls of that later, but um, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a huge turning point for me. Um, in the interest of time, I just want to speed up a little. Uh, the next project I worked on 
Um, so after emissaries, I thought, okay, I was dealing with these vast ecosystems, multi-agent simulations. What if I just focused on one character and really got deep into um, how you simulate um, the, the life of one character? And so often in artwork, you hear like, for example, painters saying like, you gotta mind the edges. And I thought if you can use a life as a compositional space, like a life, like an animal's life, um, the edges are its birth and its death. And then the journey that you observe in the composition is its life, how it got from its birth, how it grew up, what life course it took, and then how it died. And so I became obsessed with this idea of a kind of a life script or life path uh, for a creature that that could be this holistic totalizing artwork um, to really portray a life and to simulate a whole life. And so um, I started this project called Bob, which stands for Bag of Beliefs. Um, and it came from a very, very um, simple premise. It, it started from a dream. I had this dream of a, a tree that got up from its roots and started walking and turned into a snake. At the time I was going to therapy and my therapist told me like, oh, if you have this dream multiple times, like maybe, you know, you know maybe it's something that's worth exploring uh, in your work. And so I just went for it. I just thought, oh, I'm gonna make an AI, AI creature of this. Uh, at first I was gonna simulate something more humanoid, something that you and I could relate to more. And then I thought, you know, this weird snake creature, well, this would be much more both manageable, but maybe more interesting to try to recreate artificial life at the animal level, where at an animal level, at the level of a snake or some creature, like reptilian creature, all you're really dealing with are basic limbic survival behaviors. And already that's quite complex. And so I started working on the AI model for Bob, and this took, you know, maybe two, two and a half years to develop. Um, I'll play a little bit of it here real quick um, and talk over it. Um, and so Bob's AI, just to be very brief about it, um, I had searched and searched and searched, and at the time, you know, deep learning was like a huge thing. Um, this is around 2017. But I felt so much that deep learning was um, not suitable for artificial life. You know, deep learning is really good for, you know, categorizing images and identifying when there's a dog or a stop sign uh, in a group of pictures. Um, and for like, you know, sentence completion and um, grammar correction, uh, so many uses, but to simulate an artificial life form that whose imperative is to survive and to make sense of its world, deep learning is not sufficient for that. I found that out quite quickly. And then, so I became um, obsessed with this problem of how do you make a creature make sense of its world a priori, like without any priors, how do you have it just make sense of its world and start to over time create a mental map or mental world model to better un, to better uh, encounter new surprises as life as what happens in life. Um, I use the analogy, I thought the analogy of like, you know, when a when you first go to a foreign city, you apply all your prejudices and all your beliefs about how a city works. I just went to Korea recently and you know I applied all my you know uh, beliefs about how New York City works to Korea. And you know I was mostly right, you know, cities are cities. But I was wrong about certain, you know, kind of cultural mores. I was wrong about how some how, how the traffic works, how taxis work, how tipping works. I was wrong about all these things, but at least I could apply this prior model of how New York City works to this brand new situation. And that allowed me to make sense of Korea, being in Korea, and allow me to then correct my, you know, my misjudgments, my errors, and then adapt to having a new model specifically for Korea. And Richard Evans, this um, AI scientist at DeepMind, who, who I was really inspired by, he tried to he he was very inspired by Immanuel Kant and the critique of pure reason, and in that Kant was trying to articulate. This is back in the 1800s. He was trying to say that um, your experience, the sensation you have that your experience, I'm experiencing Korea, is actually an achievement. We take it for granted that we just experience things, but actually, it's the marriage of encountering a new situation and then making sense of it using your pre-existing <laughs> model of the world. And when you can make sense of something and integrate into your model of the world, you then are able to experience it. When you can't, it's like psychedelic drugs. It's how I imagine the experience of babies to be, where everything is infinitely interesting, totally meaningless, um, but you could focus on you know, the texture of a carpet and you could just stare at it for hours. Everything is overly relevant because it doesn't have this filter of a world model being applied to it. And um, I started to read Richard Evans' work in uh, trying to adapt Immanuel Kant's you know, ideas about how you make experience. Um, and what was so beautiful about his work was that 
he could he proved that his um, computational system could uh, differentiate uh, from unstructured data. It could differentiate between two different things in one or two examples, not thousands of examples like deep learning models, but one or two. And this is, I think, really truthful to how children and how animals work. Um, I have a daughter, and when I she first encountered a dog, our dog, she just thought it was a furry, petable thing. I mean, a pet is called a pet because you literally pet it. It's an opportunity for action, right, to pet. And um, when she then encountered a cat, she assumed it was a dog, but it kind of like, you know, a cat kind of hissed at her on the street. And I, and I think, I mean, I, won't, I can't, I'm imagining what she said. She couldn't articulate at the time, but I imagine the mental model she then had to adjust was, that's not a dog, that's a, that's a, that's a mean dog or a dog that doesn't want to be pet. And I said, oh, it's called a cat. And so maybe now she has a word cat for it. And she adjusted, now she has a new rule for cat. Um, and um, she learned in one example, the difference between dog and cat, not thousands. And I thought, oh, if an AI model could reproduce that amount of data efficiency for learning, um, then I think you can, you're, we're getting closer to something of how artificial life could work. Long story short, I implemented an early paper of Richard Evans dealing with this, this model. And then I combined that with another AI model that I was developing um, that I call the Congress of Demons, which is very much in, uh, um, influenced by what I was talking about, the Sims and emissaries, where I gave Bob a set of motivational needs, a hunger need, a thirst need, a need to play, a need to sleep, a need to explore, um, a need to detect threats, a need to fight, a need to flight. And I allowed each of those, I call them demons, this kind of like mini motivations to compete for use of Bob's body. So what you see in Bob isn't one coherent creature. It's actually a Congress of sub-personalities that are competing with urgency to use Bob's body. Um, and it would, when let's say the hunger demon was in Bob, it was utilizing Bob's body, uh, it would then use the Richard Evans inspired um, inference engine to make sense of the food, let's say the objects around it, what was food, what wasn't food, um, what has a kind of a, a positive or negative emotional valence through past experiences and um, proceed from there. And then the last thing I'll say about Bob is we learned very quickly that um, Bob would, through his early life experiences, through his childhood experiences, would paint itself in the corner with his beliefs and basically die. Like it would encounter maybe um, too many negative things in the environment and then wouldn't have any countervailing belief to like overturn that. And it would just, for example, stop eating or um, just run away from everything. And we realized we had to add this other layer, a parenting layer to Bob that would sort of course correct its uh, prejudices and its beliefs with other prejudices and beliefs. Um, and so we developed this app called the Bob Shrine app where you can make offerings to Bob. Um, and then those offerings appear in Bob's virtual environment as these little stars at the top of the screen here. And Bob taps on them and it releases the offering. And all those offerings are paired with a parental caption. So you might offer Bob a mushroom and Bob only has memories of poisonous mushrooms. So Bob avoids mushrooms at all costs. Um, but you might attach to uh, an offering of a mushroom with a caption that says mushrooms are nourishing or mushrooms are tasty. And Bob, if it's a new shrine, is forced on, upon encounter to override its um, life experiences and to like just listen to the parent for that one moment. And if it proves that that, that mushroom that it is forced to eat was nourishing, then it starts to revise its prior beliefs of poisonous mushrooms. Now, of course, people were like playing with it and being malicious and people would say like a poisonous mushroom is nourishing and then it would just double down on Bob, um, well, A, being poisoned and B, not believing that shrine. And so Bob died many times. And every time Bob dies, I programmed in this ability for it to retain at least 20% of its um, accrued beliefs. So it kind of had an epigenetic um, kind of resurrection. So Bob would never start from zero across all these exhibitions. Um, we can talk more about Bob later. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I just want to quickly move on to the latest project I was working on, which is called um, uh, Life After Bob. Uh, so around 2019, um, my daughter Eden, she was about to be born, and uh, I kind of struck a deal with myself. I said, oh, I'm not going to work on AI right now. As much as I love working on this, you know, I can't be staying up to 3, 4, 5 a.m. in the morning uh, working on AI anymore with a new daughter. And I was super scared and anxious about being a father. At the time, I was reading um, this book called On Writing by Stephen King, uh, the, the kind of the horror novelist. And he uh, was saying, he was talking about how when he wrote The Shining, he was imagining the worst father he would be. And the worst kind of father he thought he would be would be a, a writer with writer's block 
he was alcoholic and then had so much resentment for his new family that he ends up killing them. Um, and that's the movie The Shining with Jack Nicholson. Uh, and I thought, like, the thing that dry is going to drive this novel, or this, this new work, this cartoon, I said I was going to make a cartoon called Life After Bob. Um, things that's going to drive this is something that really scares me. I thought the worst kind of father I could be is the father who conflates his work for, for his daughter, um, kind of makes the work and, and the child the same thing. And um, I just want to show you briefly, that's, um, share my full screen here. Um, that's this character, Dr. Wong. And really briefly, the premise of this episode of Life After Bob is that Dr. Wong implants uh, an AI called Bob into his daughter's brain at birth. His daughter's called Chalice. And um, this Bob is supposed to be kind of a co-parent to Chalice, but also sort of like a uh, kind of a virtual sister in a way, a companion. And over time, Chalice um, abdicates more and more responsibility to Bob, you know, has Bob walk up a flight of stairs when she's feeling lazy, has Bob deal with an argument with her dad. Um, and over time, she abdicates more and more of the conflicts that, of, of her life to having Bob do the conflicts for her. And simultaneously, her father, Dr. Wong, falls in love more and more with the Bob side of Chalice, not the human side of Chalice. And so the human side feels, what's left for me to do? Like, I'm, I'm totally useless here. Like, this Bob, this AI, can do my fucking life better than me. And so um, that's the central kind of drama of the story. And the other last thing I'll say, um, maybe before opening up questions, is I have to kind of like, <laughs> I have to like kind of torture myself, um, maybe in a little bit, the people I work with, and do things the hard way. So I thought, oh, we're going to make this in the Unity video game engine. We're not going to do this in the traditional animation way. We're not going to do the traditional 3D animation pipeline. I have this hunch that if we make it in Unity, I can be more of an artist. You know, I have friends who are directors, and when it comes time to do reshoots or when it comes time to do editing and they're missing material or they don't like the camera angle, it's like incredibly painful to make, make the decision to like raise more money, bring the cast back, rebuild the sets um, just to make these changes and you second doubt yourself. Whereas, you know, I'm used to being an artist and using, used to changing my mind up until the last minute. And I had this gut feeling that if I kept working in Unity Video Game Engine, which I've been working in at this point for almost 10 years, um, I could change my mind all the time up until the very end. I could actually make a movie that was a work of software rather than a finished perfect movie um, that had to have a bow tied on it and just be perfectly done. Um, now that's a blessing and a curse, but for me, it was an experiment in how to make, I think maybe a movie that's um, you know cheaper, faster, and hopefully over time better um, then maybe uh, $200, $300 million uh, Pixar movies. Um, I know that's a tall order, but I feel like the metaversal future that we're rushing into like, has those affordances that you and I can make high quality media, IP, entertainment um, that is maybe not rivaling Pixar, but at least something of equivalent artistic value, um, much quicker and cheaper and faster and more artistic. And, you know, there's lots more room for mediocrity when you have like all the tools, but it's a lot, also a lot more room for new voices to enter the fray. And so I thought, oh, there's something in this about making a movie using the Unity video game engine. And so uh, that's what I made here. And um, maybe I'll just end it by um, just playing you the trailer for Life After Bob um, so you can see that. Anomics, Chalice. Break my brain before I break Anomics contract. audit, December 31st. Tell me your name. Well, run away! If I promise you can keep Bob, can you tell me your name? Chalice, the post-human cyborg super weapon brain witch. Age? 10. What does Bob do for you? Let's work. Thank you. We are aligned. Help me arrive at my destiny, but later, not now. Let's continue path planning. Good. What happens if something gets I'm in the, the way? I'm the inventor of Bob. Destiny Bob's ain't the anomic cure we hope for. <coughs> German Ava, wait. We have had contract Bob. Chalice would not survive. Bob, do something. Bob fixes it. Good. And what about life and after Bob? Bob? Don't. What happens then? Permission to try me perfect. Jealous! Welcome to my timeline, little guy. Whoa! <laughs> 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 
jealous. Just get a feel for my feet. This isn't part of the campaign. Uh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> to die? I don't know. Maybe a humanista assassinates me. Ava, ignore that. <laughs> Anomics audit January 1st. Tell me your name. The Chalice Study.